Welcome to the 24th episode of our podcast series for advisors considering the independent space. Today's episode, Mindset, Motivation, and Momentum. What's really driving all the movement? An interview with David Cantor, head of Fidelity's RIA segment. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, and on wealthmanagement.com, as well as iTunes and other resources. David Cantor, Executive Vice President and Head of the RIA segment at Fidelity Clearing and Custody Solutions, is joining me on this episode. Fidelity, as you may already be aware, offers a comprehensive clearing and custody platform, but differentiates itself from its competitors by its status as a private company and its consultative approach. David has been with Fidelity since 2009, first serving as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Fidelity Institutional Wealth Services, then as Executive Vice President of Practice Management and Consulting for Fidelity Clearing and Custody Solutions. Today, we'll really tap into David's vast knowledge and experience to explore the mindset and motivation behind some of the hottest moves to the independent space. Plus, David is well-spoken, candid, and a good guy. So I'm really thrilled to have him on the show. David, thank you so much for agreeing to talk with me today. I feel like there are a million questions I want to ask you, so I think we should just jump right in. Great. Well, Mindy, thank you very much for having me on your podcast, and congratulations on all the success. I was actually listening to your most recent one with Cheryl Penny over the weekend while I was out for a run, so I got a chance to get some exercise and learn something. I love it. So you mean I got to go along with you on your run. Love it. You know, I recommend it for those who like to exercise and learn at the same time. Sounds good. The role of the custodian, David, has become so much more than about safe asset custody. Would you share with us a bit about the work that Fidelity does for prospective breakaways and how it differentiates itself from its competitors? Yeah, I'd be pleased to, Mindy. And you're right. The role of the custodian has evolved beyond safe asset custody, very much like the role of the advisor. You know, advisors used to predominantly do investment management and asset allocation and all the things associated with the financial picture of a client's life. But as advisors go up the value stack, so do custodians. And we're doing more and more on a consultative basis. In fact, the way I like to think of it is our primary role is to help advisors find their unfair advantage. So things like practice management, access to products, access to world-class technology have really become table stakes And the way we think of ourselves, and one way we differentiate ourselves is we're business consultants, and we're business consultants that happen to be in the wealth management vertical. And the way our team works, no matter what your role is in our organization, we're trying to help breakaways, because you did ask me about breakaways, figure out why independence may be in the best interest for themselves, their clients, and their families. Tell us, David, why is the Fidelity status as a private company, why would that be relevant to an advisor? Well, we are very proud of our status as a private company. And the reason we think it's helpful for an advisor, whether you're an existing advisor with us or a prospective one, is that our status as a private company, and we've been this way throughout our history for over 70 years now, it enables us to invest for the long term and invest for the long term in somewhat counter-cyclical points in time in ways that public companies, and and there's some great public companies out there, but they can't do to the quarterly earnings cycle, the quarterly earnings pressure. So it enables us to double down in our technology investment, for example, when times are not as robust. Uh, Take 2008, 2009, for example. Uh, We actually rolled out a new technology platform for our clients. And we generally see opportunity in these counter-cyclical points in time. Got it. Okay, so not only has the role of the custodian expanded, but the independent space has morphed into something that might have been unimaginable, I think, to any of us a decade ago. And part of that is the multi-billion dollar teams that are regularly and routinely leaving the wirehouse world to become entrepreneurs. And I think it's amazed all of us. What do you think some of the factors are driving this momentum amongst advisors, actually at all asset levels, but particularly amongst the top producers of the lot? 
Sure. You know, there's a saying, if you listen to music and you like Willie Nelson, uh, there's a refrain, mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. And I would sort of turn it to the positive, (laughs) mama, please let your babies grow up to be fiduciaries. And I, I think the fiduciary trend is probably first and foremost for all of the new entrants, regardless of size. In fact, Mindy, my favorite report in the advisory space just came out earlier this week. It's called Evolution Revolution. It's put out by the Investment Advisor Association, a key trade group um, for our space. And the number of RIAs continues to grow. As a matter of fact, it grew 3.3% in 2018 versus 2017. And that's on the heels of 3% growth the year before. So the number of advisors continues to grow. And your question about the transition to the independent model, Tiburon Strategic Advisors, an independent research group, estimates that in 2016, there were 644 broker transitions to the independent model, comprising about $150 billion in assets. So the trend is clearly there. It's accelerating. And we've done our own research. Our 2018 Fidelity Advisor Movement study found that those choosing an independent model, and here it asks about both RAAs and going to independent broker dealers, uh, it's gone up from 50% of the movers going to these channels to 64%. And a full uh, 25% of, of the movers chose the RAA model. And why? Why? Because they believe that they can enhance their practice by working independently and just as I began with, delivering conflict-free advice. And they believe this can result in greater opportunities for themselves, but more importantly, for their clients and, of course, continued success in the future. You know, it's interesting. I guess a couple of comments. One is that I'd add that one of the factors driving the momentum, what you're talking about is the pull toward independence. But I think there's also the push factor, and that's the frustrations and limitations that the big firms are increasingly putting on advisors of all sides that is probably most frustrating the bigger or the more sophisticated the team is. But I do want to make one comment or ask you a question. In my world, in my view, in talking with advisors, why are house advisors actually think of themselves as fiduciaries? Because what they think of themselves as is always putting the interest of their clients first, regardless of what standard they're held to. So can you weigh in for just a second on the difference between actually being a fiduciary and just thinking of yourself as one? Uh, Mindy, it's a great, great point and a great question, because the fiduciary duty, as I like to say, and I I think you know this, I'm a recovering lawyer. I actually got my start forming RAAs back in the mid-90s in Northern California. So I've been in this space and at this for a long time. So the fiduciary duty is not self-executing. But what I think is a primary difference, and you touched on it a bit, is when you're working for another firm, if you're working for a big firm such as a wirehouse, despite the fact that you maybe acting as a fiduciary, there still are certain guardrails in terms of the products and services and activities and downright capabilities that you're allowed to offer your clients. We find that this is a common refrain, perhaps a common frustration from the wirehouse advisors we're talking to. You know, we hear I can only use this type of technology uh, solution because it's mandated for all 11,000 advisors at my firm. You know, we hear that we can't do any custom reporting because the compliance policies and procedures have to sort of revert to the mean. So customization, the ability to provide broader, more expansive and tailored services along with being fiduciary is something many advisors we talk to are longing for. And in fact, one of the drivers that I think you you touched on. Okay, got it. That makes good sense. So I'd love to focus a bit on the top end of the market. I know that Fidelity has recruited some of the biggest and best advisors in the country recently. And I get that you need to protect your client's privacy, so you may not be able to share some details. But I'd love it if you're able to share with us some of the stories behind the moves. Like, who are these advisors? How much were they managing? Where did they come from? What drove them toward independence? And whatever else you think is appropriate. Sure. As you know, we are very sensitive to clients' privacy, and it's really hard to single out examples because there have been so many 
great examples of firms that have come from a captive environment and all of a sudden they've become one of the newly minted largest advisory firms in the country. But I've spoken to some firms we work with and you know they've given consent to share their stories and I, and I, I think I'll choose a few from the first eight months of this year because I think they're indicative. I heard, Mindy, in one of your other podcasts that one of the guests shared that there are about 697 RAAs in the country. And, and by RAAs, these are sort of wealth management focused RAAs, sort of excluding the big asset management firms that are also RAAs. But 697 that have a billion or more in assets under management. And this is an area we've been very focused on. We often do it in conjunction with our family office business. And I'll talk more about that later if we have time. But one example that I think is probably right on point in June of this year, we helped the path to independence for a firm called Core Private Wealth. And Core is a firm based in New York City with offices on the West Coast as well that comprised of five partners and interestingly, a multi-generational group and was operating as a true ensemble within the wirehouse. But for many of the reasons we spoke about, the desire to not only act as a fiduciary, but leverage world-class technology, access to a broader array of products and services, and go beyond what was mandated by them, by their, to them, by their former employer, they chose to go independent after a long process. And so core private wealth instantly became one of the largest advisory firms in the country. They filed their ADV, they moved into office space, and they're past the transition phase and into what we call the stabilization phase. So that's just one example. And by the way, I think they're also indicative because you're seeing more and more of these large teams that serve ultra high net worth families. And that's precisely the space that Core um, plays in. Yeah, that's such an interesting description. And thank you for sharing it. Interesting because probably from where I sit, the thing that's changed the most in the last couple of years is the number one rejoinder we got more often than anything was, I would love to be independent. It's appealing to be, to have more control and more freedom, but I run an ultra high net worth business. My ultra high net worth clients wouldn't respond to my being independent. And what you're saying is, is that a business like Core with four billion in assets under management and ultra high net worth clients chose independence because they were servicing ultra high net worth clients. That's precisely right. And one of the things that I can tell you was attractive to them was the fact that we have our family office business. It's a business we've been in for over 10 years here at Fidelity. And we're able to deliver solutions, to curate solutions if they're not ours, but also access to a wide variety of best practices that we've learned, assembled, and gathered by serving the family office business. Yeah. So why did CORE specifically choose Fidelity as custodian? And did they utilize a service provider or a consultant for transition planning and execution? Sure, you know, and and I can tell you I was I was there in the earliest of meetings that we had with Core and I've learned long ago in this business Mindy or I should say this profession because I am very um keen on referring to advisors as operating within a profession. We all are within the greater wealth management industry, but it is a profession. So I would I've learned long ago never to speak for others because, you know, they have their own points of view, but I'll give you my impressions. I think they were very attached to our consultative approach. And we began our first meeting with the, the, the question I shared with you, why is independence in the best interest of your clients, yourselves, all of you as partners, and your families? Because at the end of the day, remember, these folks were starting a business. And you know, I, I think I shared with you, I am a podcast junkie. And I actually recommend to any group that's thinking about going independent and starting their own firm, Beyond listening to your podcast, there's a great podcast called Startup. It's also available on iTunes. And remember, you're starting your own business. And so I think it was our consultative approach. But as we dug deeper into it, it was about how could we make sure we were doing the best education for them, sharing the best path forward, sharing the known unknowns and contemplating what the unknown unknowns could be. And just as I said earlier, you know, we place a big emphasis on finding your unfair advantage. 
And there's more to it, but why don't I just pause there, Mindy, and see if you, you want to toggle to any other examples. Do you have any follow-ups? Yeah, no, no, that's great. I'd love to hear about a couple other examples if you're able to share. Yeah, another firm that we helped transition to full independence this year is a firm called Landsberg Bennett. And this is a firm that had been in the independent broker-dealer model you know, at a firm that offers an independent model, but not fully independent. You're still drafting off of this firm's ADV and required to operate within their technology, their policies and procedures, and their sort of what I'll say one size fits all financial arrangement vis-a-vis the, the firm and the advisory team working within that model. And this firm had similar desires, but I'd say not only had they been halfway independent because they were within an independent broker-dealer model, they really wanted more and more flexibility in terms of the products they could offer, the services, the investment styles, because they were sort of put within certain guardrails. And similar story, they wanted flexibility and choice for their clients. So we started working with them actually last year and went through a process over the summer Because they were within an independent broker-dealer model, they actually had to resign and give notice. So it's a little bit different transition process. And we're pleased to help Landsberg Bennett, you know, a great, again, a a young multi-generational group of partners, you know, serving the high net worth and the ultra high net worth uh, business. And how much in assets under management, David? They're about 600 to 700 million in assets under management. Got it. You know, it's so interesting to me, again, that I think a lot of advisors think independence is independence. So if you're at an independent broker dealer, or alternatively, you're moving from a wirehouse firm or traditional brokerage firm as an employee to independent broker dealer, it doesn't really matter whether you're independent broker dealer or RIA, you're still independent. And what you're talking about here is the operating with guardrails. I actually like that term of art because I think that that's right, that those guardrails can oftentimes create a model that advisors outgrow. And it sounds like that's the case with this team. So did this team, since they were already independent, was the transition and the execution of getting it off the ground, going from IBD to RIA, was it as onerous? Was there as much involved as for a traditional breakaway from a from an employee model? Yeah, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, back to my earlier disclosure, I, I never can speak for folks in terms of what is in their hearts and minds. I think it is easier because their clients are used to operating with them as the advisor. And and in general, in the independent broker-dealer model, the clients are actually the clients of the advisory team and not of the firm. Hmm. And and that is a big, that's a big difference. However, one thing I will say is that when you're starting your own business and when you're a team within an IBD, in many cases, you haven't formed the operating entity, be it a corporation or an LLC. You still have to go through the regulatory process and file your form ADV. And it's all the business startup things that are consistent with starting any business, whether it's office space, technology, and standing up a new business. So, and I I left out the fact that you have to, you know, attend to the relevant HR elements of this. Mm -hmm. So I think it is easier from a client perspective, but there still are, you know, the rigors of just in general business startup and business management. Mm -hmm. Got it. And if I could add one one other thing, um, which I think is, is key, we and my team, myself personally, We spend a lot of time studying other professions and industries. I'm a member of a group called Boston Harbor Angels, working in the startup community, because again, any business, there are common refrains when you're doing a startup, but you have a huge advantage in in this wealth management space is you generally begin with clients and you already have the most important thing of any business is clients that are going to generate a source of revenue for you. So that's where the role of custodians and other partners in this RA ecosystem, such as yourself, can help with the other business management elements that are so important. Yeah, I think that's spot on. Was there another example you can share with us, David, another breakaway team? Well, you know, this year has been really ripe with some good examples because for all the reasons we've been speaking about, there is this movement 
toward independent, full fiduciary advice models. But I'd share one that we worked on together, the Wyeth team out of Pennsylvania. And this was one, you've asked me about partners. This was one that we collaborate on with, with your team, with the Dynasty team, and of course, Fidelity. And I'd say that there were similar reasons and drivers for this team and a young team, as you know. The three partners, about $650 million or so under management, you know, a heavy e- emphasis with executives in a certain geography in the Pennsylvania, Delaware area, and heavy uh, wealth management, heavy planning emphasis firm. And I think they wanted to work with Fidelity because of our private company nature. Again, I don't want to speak for anyone because of our commitment to investing in technology. And I think culture was important to them. And I think that the culture of our firm, of course, of your firm and, and Dynasty helped them in their decision and was appealing to them. Yeah, well, thank you for the promotion. Yes, we did that deal. The senior member of that team will actually be a guest on a future podcast here. I know they were generating about $7 million in annual revenue at their firm and managing close to a billion in assets and were super excited about independence. And actually, we've spoken to them since and talk about how flawless the execution has been and how excited they are just weeks after launch. So that's pretty cool. So let me pivot for a second. Getting from here to there meaning going from being a captive employee to being an independent business owner. By waving a magic wand is probably every prospective breakaway's dream, but we all know it's not how it works. Would love to hear what it really takes from your perspective to make the leap a successful one. So a couple of points there. What are the options for accessing capital? or unlocking some liquidity on the way in, because that's always a huge thing, not only because an advisor is likely comparing it against options where a big transition check is being waived at them, but also many of them walk away from a large sum of unvested deferred comp and don't want to do so without being made whole on that and protecting themselves. So let's start there. The getting from here to there, what's involved, and what are the options for accessing capital or accessing liquidity? Sure. And as we like to say, to paraphrase a commercial that was, I think, on in the 70s, and I'm paraphrasing here, we believe in educated prospective client is going to be our best client. Because to make this leap successful, it does take preparation and education. And we view our role, as I was uh, sharing earlier, as curators of information, as consultants, to help folks understand this RAA ecosystem, which is expanding and becoming more and more complex all the time, certainly since I started in this profession back in the mid-90s. So it's really about education, but then it becomes planning and preparation. And that's a big emphasis that we place on things. In terms of accessing capital, there are more and more choices. And we started about three years ago, something we call our M&A Leaders Forum. This M&A Leaders Forum brings in experts from the strategic acquirer world, firms such as Hightower, for example, of Wealth Partners Capital, Private equity firms are members of this forum, investment bankers and strategic advisors, as well as, um, you know, firms that are RIA acquirers. And the good news, if you're either in a wirehouse setting or an independent broker dealer setting or you're an existing RIA, there's never been as much access to capital as there is now. You know, money is flowing to this profession because it is a growing business. People want advice and they deliver consistent revenue streams. So part of our job is to help a team sort out what we call their options for independence. Do they want to form their own business? Do they want to partner with another firm? Do they want to become part of a strategic acquirer like a high tower? Do they want to work with a firm like a Focus Financial? And so our job, in addition to consulting, is to help them understand those options available within this RAA ecosystem. And just, I guess, one note, and and I think you said this earlier, or at least in another podcast, there's just growth in terms of the number of consulting firms that are out there that could provide you capital and consulting firms that could help you. There's diamond consultants, there are um, business designed consultants, There are uh, compliance consultants, 
There's any number of technology platforms. And our job, I think, is to share experiences and help breakaways navigate this marketplace and ecosystem. I actually refer to all of this support as a cottage industry that's been really born to support the breakaway advisor. And so the first thing an advisor has to do is to decide how much help he, he or she wants, what kind of help he or she needs, and there's no shortage of ways to get it, whether that help be transition support, access to capital, to loans, to whatever it may be. So I agree with you 100%. I want to shift for a second to independence and the benefit for clients. Because, you know, we talk about independence being for those who want to be real fiduciaries. And we know that the definition of fiduciary begins and ends with what's best for clients. So from your perspective, how is independence better for a client? You know, maybe it's best described or expressed in terms of the conversations we have with advisors going independent. As I shared earlier, we ask what it's in it for the client, because if the client is not supportive, it's really not making worth making this move. And uh, that survey that I shared with you earlier, our advisor movement survey, we look at advisors who are contemplating a move, and then we go back to those that did and, and ask for feedback as to, well, what actually happened? And 100% of the movers surveyed, 100%, Mindy, said that their clients were ultimately supportive of their move and more than half receive immediate support from the moment they tell them. The others will ultimately, after they've had time to understand the decision and the implications, will follow suit. So it's the level of, of information and education that you'll have to give your, your client, soon to be prospective client of your firm, of your new firm. And so I thought I was, I'd share with you, I, I prepared um, a little script that I've helped firms with in the past. Obviously, this is a, a template. That would be fabulous. This is a template, Mindy. So obviously, it has to be tailored to any advisor's client to the specifics that they, they would like. But, but here it is, and let's see what you think. So here I'm playing the role of an advisor talking to my prospective client as after I've made the move. By the way, shortly after. Here, here we go. Remember last year when we were discussing a former colleague of mine who left the big firm and went independent? And I shared with you that he, she started her own firm. At the time, you asked me, well, would I ever consider taking that route? Would I ever do that? I answered that I would like to, but I needed to learn more before I'd make the leap and start my own firm. Well, a year later, I've done the research and we've decided to start our own firm and we couldn't be more excited. And we're excited because we believe we can provide to you enhanced services above and beyond what we previously could do. Now you're going to have access in your whole family to the best wealth management products and services that Main Street has available. And it's offered to you without being within the mandates of the confines of a larger firm. There'll be more flexibility, more choice. We can customize things. And ultimately, I think it's going to be better to help you and your family meet just not just your financial goals, but your life goals. I love it. I think that's great. How is independence then better for an advisor? Well, you know, independence is better for an advisor. And again, we, we have to make sure that they're bought into the fact that they want this flexibility, want this choice, and they want to operate where they are charting their course forward for their own future. So Provided they have the right mindset, we think there are three main advantages. One, the advisors that we've surveyed believe that they're more satisfied with their work. So just generally job satisfaction, they're happier, they have more energy, they still get to work with their colleagues and their clients, but they're doing so on their terms. So that's that job satisfaction angle. Two, they have the chance to build a business that will endure. So they're creating enterprise value um, not just for themselves and their families, but their colleagues, their partners and their employees. And we spend a lot of time, you mentioned it earlier, on the economics and the economic implications of forming your own firm. It's a great way to build economic value. And I, and I guess the third part of it is the culture that they get to create. It's probably related to job satisfaction, but the culture of owning your own business, the culture 
of developing that next generation talent, the culture of running a firm in the way you really want to. And that's what we hear time and time again. I think the most important stat I would give you is I have never talked to a firm that's gone independent that wanted to go back. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there have been firms that have decided to take some liquidity by doing a transaction with a private equity firm or a firm like the Focus Financials of the world, but I've never seen a firm decide they want to go back and rejoin the wirehouse. I think that's very rare. I'm sure it must happen, but it, it hasn't happened in my direct experience. Actually, I'm smiling because just two weeks ago, I ran into the first, a team that had been independent. One of the members had sold his small independent firm to a wirehouse, or he moved to a wirehouse because as a one-man band 15 years ago, one, I don't think the cottage industry of support was there in a robust enough way. And he was a one-man band and got tired of it and thought that he would be better off back at a major firm. He spent the last 15 years at a major firm, and he is he called me because, in fact, now he's tired of it. All the pushes and pulls you and I talked about earlier, he's fed up with, and now he's looking looking to go back to independence, obviously, in a more robust way. So I agree with you. There aren't many, but there are some. Sure. Well, there's always examples, I guess. Yeah, exactly. All right. So one of the things I think that concerns a lot of folks are the logistics. You know, we talk about sort of blithely that everything that they are able to do for clients as an employee of a major firm, they can replicate as an independent, specifically. How does an independent RIA get access to or able to offer credit cards or access to lending or investment banking or insurance to his clients? Sure. Well, that's a key role of a custodian. One of the things custodians do beyond asset custody is offer access to products, services, technology, such as the ones you mentioned, credit cards, lending, either through margin or other facilities access to insurance products. And if we can't offer it directly, I think one of the beauties, and I think more and more prospective breakaways are becoming aware of it, suddenly you have access to coverage of the best of the wealth management space can offer. And the wealth management space in terms of products, services, uh, suppliers, if you will, or manufacturers, the RAA space is among the hottest right now. So on day one of becoming independent, a firm may have access to higher quality products and services and higher quality coverage than ever before. So that's one of the things, as I was sharing earlier, as we help firms explore their options for independence that we spend a lot of time on. You know, what are the products and services that they're looking to avail themselves of? We actually call that a mapping exercise, mapping the products and services they need to the clients that they would avail of. Okay. And how about technology in the RIA space? How would you say it compares generally to the wirehouse world? And I'm going to ask you a specific question. I know that the wirehouses, all of them, the major firms have made major investments of late in technology. And a lot of it deploying machine learning or artificial intelligence as a way of uh, helping advisors grow or further mine their books. How does technology compare? Would an advisor have to sacrifice anything in terms of access to cutting edge technology if in fact he went independent? The answer is, I don't think they have to sacrifice anything at all. I believe that the technology choices available for advisors are in fact, more robust and importantly, more customizable. Um, When you're working at a large firm and they have made investments in technology, remember, this is for a group of thousands of advisors. When you're charting a technology solution for your own firm, you can, working with custodians, consultants, and the technology providers themselves, craft the solution that you want and do so with firms that have been curating, building, and offering technology to advisors for many, many years. So whether it's performance reporting, whether it's CRM systems, whether it's modeling and rebalancing, whether it's planning modules, there is best of breed out there. And some of these companies actually make instances for the larger firms, instances of their technology. 
And, and at Fidelity, it is a huge commitment of ours. I, Mindy, I think you know our parent company purchased a firm called eMoney Advisor several years ago, which is a world-class financial planning module, but more importantly, a portal designed to communicate between advisors and their clients. So we're big believers in technology as a way to deliver an enhanced client experience, uh, but also make advisors' lives uh, much more easy and efficient. And I guess I, if I have time, I'll go on to two more aspects that I think are important to your question. Go ahead. Go for it. Yeah. Artificial intelligence is, is clearly the buzz, and, and I want to talk about that. But let's not forget digitization. Advisors and all of us need to digitize our businesses to make it more elegant and easy for clients to consume the services and also easier on the advisors. I can't think of a business today that doesn't have a digitization strategy. So we must talk about artificial intelligence, but digitization is also important. And so how do you expect technology to continue to evolve? I expect technology to get more accessible. I expect technology for every advisory firm to be on every client's telephone or cell phone, I should say, or mobile iPad. I think that every advisory firm, independent or otherwise, if you're not relevant on a client's cell phone like every other app, you have to wonder what are they doing every other time they're using their phone. So I think that it's going to be ubiquitous. And I think that it's important that advisors have a way to engage digitally with their clients, whether it's from a messaging standpoint, whether from it's from a service standpoint, I think it's critically important. There are certainly clients that want to meet in person, but digital is so vital to the future, especially with the younger investors. I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, the commentary is that so much of what's driven growth in the independent space is the leveling of the playing field, that anything and everything that is available to an employee advisor of a major firm can equally be accessed. Maybe it's accessed in a different way, but accessed if you're an independent as well without sacrificing quality. And it sounds like technology is no exception. Exactly. And on the artificial intelligence front, you know, we're doing a lot uh, as a company the promise of big data to tease out insights that might not normally or ordinarily be be used by advisors is certainly a big focus of ours. And we're doing it by focusing on something we call consolidated data. And that's to recognize uh, how do we provide a more complete picture about the investor to the advisor. And using data to identify substantial events that could affect an investor's life that do affect an investor's life uh, to help advisors with prompts to better serve their clients. And so I, I think this is going to be a big focus for us. What we're trying to do is serve these digital solutions, these artificial intelligence solutions that we're creating here at Fidelity to all of our advisors. So generally speaking, technology aside, what do you think the RIA space looks like five years from now? I think it continues to grow. I, I talked to you earlier about the uh, Evolution Revolution report. I think that we are going to continue to see this exodus toward becoming a full fee-based or fee-only fiduciary. And I think that the number of solutions out there in terms of the models that you can go into, in addition to starting your own firm, will, will also expand. Yeah. And what impact do you think a bear market has on newly minted RIAs? Well, you know, we've been doing this long enough that you have to make your decision and make your plans uh, irrespective of market cycles or any individual market event. Uh, I think many advisors we are talking to are planning uh, for, if not a bear market, certainly a, a uh, market correction of sorts. And many advisors see that as an opportunity. That's an opportunity to get investors that had been either going it alone or it may prompt uh, you know, some unease with their current uh, provider. So most of the advisors we talk to you know, end up gaining clients in a bear market or in a market correction environment. Interesting. So one last question. Again, I could go on all day, but you've got things to do and I'm going to let you go. But 
One last thing, what advice would you offer prospective breakaways or anything we haven't covered that you feel people should know or understand? I I think that you've got to start with a question that I shared earlier. Why is going independent in the best interests of your clients, yourself, and your family? And if you have more than one partner in your advisory team, you should all ask that question of one another. And then you have to take it a step further. You have to be clear that you're starting a business and you have to ask five questions. Who is your target market? Is it the target market you have at at a wirehouse or, or other employer? Or is it a new target market? Do you have different target markets? What capabilities will you offer? And you have to be clear on what those capabilities are. Number three, how will you be organized? Who will lead the firm? What roles and responsibilities will each of the partners and support staff have? Number four, what will your infrastructure be? Whether technology, whether compliance, whether financial controls, whether office space. And number five, and I talked about this earlier, but I think it's critical, is what is your unfair advantage? Remember, competition is everywhere. One thing is for sure, in this wealth management space, differentiation has never been more important. So whether it's a particular specialization that you have, whether it's a particular breadth of service that you could offer, or whether it's your special relationship with your clients, you have to be clear what your unfair advantage is. Maybe, Mindy, you can invite me back on another podcast and I can share, you know, the one unfair advantage that every firm has but overlooks. But those are the five questions that we always ask a prospective breakaway. And frankly, we ask our existing clients as well. Love it. And that's a deal, David. I'm going to hold you to that. We're going to have you back for another podcast interview because there's a lot more to talk about. And I really appreciate your time and your insights. And I'm certain that so will everyone else. Well, thank you, Mindy. Congratulations. And here's to your continued success. Thank you. Thank you again. David covered so much ground about everything from how the role of the custodian has changed over time to why so many multi-billion dollar teams are choosing independence. But what really stood out to me is his commentary around what it means to be a real fiduciary and essentially saying that it's impossible to do so while sitting as an employee at a brokerage firm. In our next episode, I'll be exploring the motivations behind advisor movement the pushes and pulls, as we call them, and talking about things like what's inspiring folks to jump ship from where they've built their life's work to pursue other firms or even business models. You may be surprised by the answer, and so I hope you'll join us. Until then, I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. And if you're not already a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. Feel free to email me or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908-879-1002 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. Thank you for listening. I also want to thank wealthmanagement.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.